all of my images are made completely from old vintage costume jewelry. So I either collect it at uh, state sales or swap meets or people these days just give me big boxes of jewelry because they know that's what I do. I photograph each piece on a, uh, on a white background, each individual piece, and then I mask them out and in the computer, in Photoshop, I composite them together and I make these scenes. Okay, so if you're looking at an image like this, every single one of these components you've photographed. Started as an individual piece of jewelry on a white background. And then I take them and put them together and, so this and repeat is a digital them. Print that I'm it's, looking at. it's a digital composite and then it's an archival print. The crispness and the detail and the opulence is really overwhelming. How did you discover that interest? Well, you know, I was an advertising photographer for a lot of years. Okay, so I the hero that. shot. Absolutely. The pretty lighting. Right. Like well, that. and I did food photography too, which mm -hmm. is even more involved and complex and everything has to be more perfect. So uh, I did that for a lot of years, and about six years ago, I started doing this. I started working on my own art mm -hmm. that wasn't art directed by somebody else. Mm -hmm. I enjoy the freedom and the, the inward focus of that a lot. The reason I use jewelry is because it's a, it's a man-made expression of beauty. I went to Catholic school for a lot of years, okay, and the basis of this series is about the myth of paradise. It's the idea that paradise is a man-made idea of beauty just as my piece of jewelry is man-made uh, beauty. So there's a know. kind of a sort of like over opulent Garden of Eden kind of symbolism. I mean, it's not necessarily because it feels really joyful. It doesn't really feel like a sort of, you know, indictment of desire uh, or anything right. like that, but it's really over the top. Now, right? you know, in my heart, what I'm trying to do here is just, just express the joy of life. No, you're not imagining things, though <laughs> that is a what do you call a family of whales? It has an amazing name, like a clutch, pod. a pod. That's yes. right. A pod of beluga whales. I guess most people probably would want to know why whales. Well, I'm always interested in the living environment of animal or people. And this is inspired by a trip back home to Taiwan. The aquariums around the world are starting to buy belugas to oh. show. Is it becoming endangered or just popular? It's a popular thing to watch. However, they start dying everywhere, like in Vancouver, in Chicago. They're just, oh no. It's just not a natural environment. So I thought, how odd to put a North Sea creature in the aquarium. In the South Sea. Yeah, so I, <laughs> I made a clay model of the beluga and I had it made into a balloon. And I took it everywhere I go and I took picture of them in the odd environment that they don't belong. Like a tree in Beverly yeah. Hills. It's just as odd as an aquarium yeah. in the South Sea. But I don't want to make it so political. I no. just like it whimsical and it's mm -hmm. fun. And well, these are the caviar whales too. Yeah. I mean, when people talk, they think beluga, that's beluga caviar. That's mm -hmm. the sort of what people are looking for. So I like that idea that that's in Beverly Hills too, yeah. where caviar grows on trees. <laughs> The strangest thing of all, I think, is that this is a night gallery that you're in. So all these shots are done at night with long single exposures. And then I walk into the frame of my shots to create the figures that you see and the photographs with figures in them. Because the exposure is so long that right. you've got plenty of time to leave the camera and go. And, and it's so black out there when I'm shooting right. that I can't see a lot of my shots. 85% of my shots I can't see. So when I move in front of the camera, I'm like Houdini in front of the camera. The negative just can't pick me up until I do a flash of light behind me with a flash unit in my hand. So if you're the camera, I would do the flash this way into a wall. And that's why it and looks like a, a silhouette. shadow. Yeah, <gasps> it's a silhouette that becomes translucent with the moonlight lighting it up after I leave that silhouette. This is the it's fourth time silhouette. I've had this explained to me in 10 years, but I actually <laughs> think I understand it this time. That's the illusion that's created of being in the daytime. It's just simply the length of the exposure Correct. is such that it could pull that much light even out of a dark night moonlight sky. Moonlight can make the sky turn blue, even though it's black all night long. Oh. Moonlight is a reflector board of the sun. So yes, yes. That's what I knew that. Back. Right. And so when I do an hour long exposure compared to a oh daylight God. exposure so a fraction of a second. Okay. And uh, that's about, uh, you know, uh, a half million times longer than a daylight exposure. So you're getting right. back half a million times. Yeah. When light. you say long exposure, people are thinking yeah. five minutes, 10 minutes. Well, right behind me, a that's little. five hours. That's six hours, actually, for the big tree right there. And that's and those why are the, the stars going by etching into the negative. Now, How I don't walk into this one, but I, the star of the show is the stars. Mm -hmm. Oh, here it's me falling in love with a wheel finally. And then here it's me as a production partner. 
I did four years of my life production pottery and I was on peace count so we had to throw for a factory and then over there that piece is um, also a piece I used to climb up in the morning on Sundays and pull all the clothes out and do fashion shows so then when my parents woke up my brother had to clean it all up again 40 dresses back into the cupboards and I love happiness. you so, there really is a lot, you were saying autobiographical, I mean I really, what I like about them is that there's a sort of a child-like quality, not child-ish, but child-like quality, you know, whimsy, I think you used the word, a little scenes from a childhood and a young artist's life, but at the same time, the work that goes into producing each one of these is very not whimsical. I mean, it's an, it's, it looks labor intensive. It looks, you know, sort yeah. of difficult. Each part is made on the pottery wheel. So this is already one, two, three, four, five, six parts made on the pottery wheel. Just this wheel. one tiny little yeah. pig is six different. So how I do it is usually I have the overall idea in my, in my, in my head, but then I go for two days and throw all the parts. And then I have a Tupperware container where I keep them all. And then the rest of the month I put it all together in one piece. And it's wonderful to see in an era where so many, especially people who are incorporating, are kind of playing it safe and going with low, fodder, low fire pottery that you chose to go with a much more difficult, you know, mm -hmm. medium by going high fire, incorporating the sculpture into the stoneware, into the porcelain without making it all mold based and casting by, you know, making it kind of in the old style, by hand, mm -hmm. where so much of work today is casted, put together. Production. Production wear, and yeah. that it is so wonderful to see you take sort of, you know, your history. Which I mean, that's Dick Cheney, right? Okay, that's Dick Cheney. Let's talk George about Bush. Dick Cheney. <laughs> okay, this, this image is, um, Basically, the story starts with the hanging chat, like 2001, <laughs> the election. Everybody see that? Yes. That's a hanging chat. The hanging chat. Okay. Then Bush and Cheney come to power. Bush is the knight and he's the clown. And uh, they both play with the praying bits, which are the same in every religion. And uh, the trick us into war. And this guy is counting Cheney's money to reflect on the connection with uh, Halliburton and all that. And uh, yeah, this guy stuck forever to count his money. That's us uh, pulling the cart and we get the flower. Mm -hmm. And this is the death pushing the wheelchair of war. It's called the age of reason or the uh, night, yeah. the death and the devil. Also making connection with um, Albert so, Durer. Uh, so a registered Republican. Me. <laughs> I'm Canadian, I'm Canadian. Oh, she's Canadian. Canadian. You're looking at my work, which is a combination of metal, stone and glass. I'm inspired by several things, one of which the miraculous equation of life, that moment when this genesis happened and um, our world was created. So I've incorporated stone and glass to symbolize water and the geologic formations that we have here on Earth. This sculpture is called the Spirit Within. It's a female figurative form and it has an inner volume of glass which is symbolic of an inner an inner spirit. It's a combination of steel and glass and granite. These diving forms are created in many materials. This one happens to be um, steel, glass and granite. And for me the diving forms are obviously um, a depiction of how people are plunging into the water, but for me it goes beyond that into a deeper meaning, that being this magnificent part of our of people's lives where they plunge into something. They plunge into the unknown, they make that commitment, they stand on the edge and they dive into something like a marriage or a business or some kind of endeavor where they have to commit themselves. To and I do photo montage, which is a technique of sandwiching negatives and uh, using multiple enlargers. And all my pieces are done with uh, probably a minimum of three photographs, which I blend together in an analog way, because now the big word is digital. When I started 20 years ago, there was no such thing as digital. It wasn't a big word. And um, I do essentially black and white because of the dark room techniques, and I can't do color. 
So uh, this, for instance, is a piece called Econotour, where I blended uh, Paris, the Ponte Vecchio in Florence, I've got the Sphinx in Giza, I've got Els Castle in Germany, and this all started with Times Square in New York. This is called Drive Through Gallery. It was actually the, a commissioned piece for the Sausalito Art Festival, which was, uh, th that's why it's the Golden Gate Bridge, and it's called Drive Through Gallery, where there's all these artwork pieces, and we don't have time to smell the coffee, we just drive through in our quick, fast paced society. I read an interview where they're asking now there's a lot of people doing it with uh, d doing things with computers and and he's really open about it and I and so am I I mean I, I think art it's not really what paintbrush you use even though a lot of people say wow that's great you know you're 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 doing it in analog and and, and it's also the fact that um, young kids look at black and white and they think it's cool you know, mm -hmm. wow, how black and white, because they're so, they, they never saw TV in black and white. I remember when the TV was in black and white. Mm -hmm. See, I grew up in Japan, and most of my back, culture background is Japanese. They're, but I've been living here for more than 30 years, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to do sort of a East meets West. Mm -hmm. So my work, as you see, has a touch of Western feeling to it. That's my goal to do it and a beautiful aesthetic and one of my favorite aesthetics uh, when I look at art is that sort of this notion of when you have a piece like this to have one ball is enough. Do you really <laughs> right. need 50 balls in your cupboard? When you have the perfect ball it's not about quantity it's about the experience right? That's exactly It's so it. funny when you were talking about um, the imagery and I thought, but it's completely abstract. And then I realized, I caught up with you, and I realized we can have a conversation about this bowl that is identical to a conversation we could have about an abstract painting. I've always been a portrait painter. I've always painted figures and humans. And these, to me, are like portraits of objects. I mean, I, I mm -hmm. take the same approach that it would to a, a human subject. There's a visceral connection. There's an emotional connection. Uh, sometimes the design, the composition is what really draws me in. But my intent is to stay connected to the object and to the process by doing this as quickly and as uh, emotionally as I can. My interest is really more not an intellectual process as much as an emotional process and a visceral connection that I have with the object. Something you might normally more associate with, with portrait paintings. With portraits, yeah. Because Which you I have take to that. Yeah, I take okay. that same approach that I would with a, with a figure. I put the figure in front of me in every case that I can um, in my studio, and I have sort of a, a dialogue with the object, if you will, similar to I might with the figure. And the dialogue is sometimes just a, a memory I have, a connection, or something that triggers an emotion from the past, a historic reference. Your childhood or the past yeah. in general. It's like hearing an old song or something that makes a connection. You see some of these objects and they make a connection. You don't remember why or how. Now, but there's something that, that leads you to it, and then it becomes an issue of design mm -hmm. and sometimes composition, but in all cases I paint them in one sitting and I try to just get that experience firsthand and not have it get watered down or lose that connection. Just so it's all about done, it too much. don't overthink it, I just do it, it's an immediate reaction and uh, in doing it that way it stays fresh. Fantastic. You know? And you can really see that sort of quickness in the way that you know the brush strokes are right there yeah. on the surface. It's you know. Yeah, like a lot of artists block <laughs> in and then they go back in and they noodle it, massage it like a sculpture or whatever. What I do is I do the block in and then I leave it. It's one pass. Everything is one pass. This piece is part of a series of pictures I did when I first actually got to LA, um, and they're all of independent motels around Hollywood, um, and they're all kind of you know really run down advertising. This one's got you know. Waterbed, FM radio, all the mod cons. Uh, and it's something that's really appealed to me when I first moved here. Uh, so I actually started in uh, photography back in newspapers, back in England, and I worked my way up from a local paper to a national newspaper. Um, and did many, have traveled all over the world shooting for them. Um, and then I came to LA where I now shoot mainly editorial, like music and celebrities. And this is just something I've been doing on the, on the side really, and it's something that really spoke to me when I first came to LA. Especially the motel series, I just found fascinating that these places still existed and were still still running as a business. Yeah.